Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on philosophy, German thought, and specifically Heidegger. A thinker who's easy to love and hate. He has been very influential. He is a bridge between Nietzsche and later French thought, and whether or not you like German or French thought or French, German or French people or language at all, who does? I mean, yeesh, we're Anglophonic folks. We compete with the French and German world along with the Europeans altogether against, well, the world. So with all of that, of course, got to hate on the French and the Germans and then be massively influenced and be in total denial and ignorance about that in the Anglophonic world. So if you do want to know a bunch about art, philosophy, thought, and be cool, man, you probably want to know some basic German concepts of philosophy, then their influence on French thought and philosophy just a little bit. In order to be hip and cool, and then all you do is you drop a name here or there or a word, existentialism, and people think you're deep, and that is the point, to wear dark t-shirts and have people think you are deep. Again, a group of existentialists is a brood, like a murder of crows and Poe. So, with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, we have brooding Germanic-ish, in language at least, thinkers. Uh, they're both forerunners of Heidegger and existentialism, which is a very popular word and in fact, art is very much moving from existentialism to postmodernism a lot back and forth, and mostly towards cynical acceptance of existential-like times, which is very postmodern. And to understand all that, it is cool to understand a few German thoughts and a few French thoughts. So that's what we're doing. Now, Heidegger is a particularly controversial thinker. Now, I went to Berkeley as an undergrad and took some classes. I went to the uh, Graduate Theological Union to earn a master's degree, and I know a lot about philosophy, religion, and the history of thought. And I chose to look at the bigger picture with science, religion, and all of that, as uh, with philosophy. So with all of that, I have had Heidegger classes uh, with some folks who are weighty, uh, Dreyfus um, and others. Uh, in this, uh, Forrest Hartman is an institution, has been. Um, there are people in this town who are very into Heidegger. Now, Heidegger is very loved and hated in philosophy, and in Berkeley, and in American philosophy, because Heidegger is a very compelling, interesting thinker, but he is somebody who... He is someone uh, who was an open Nazi and also has thoughts that get away from objective truth towards the foundational truth of, and meaning of subjectivity and things being in motion like Heraclitus and Nietzsche. So he is somebody uncomfortable for the Americans, but he's also somebody uncomfortable for the continent because he is uncomfortable for the uh, Anglophonics and the Americans and the Brits. Because he's not an analytic thinker, he parts ways from Kant, uh, very, and that there's static, ideal, objective truth and mathematical morals and ma uh, that there is objective morals and math very much, but a very Nietzsche-like. Please see Nietzsche before you see Heidegger. Otherwise, a lot of Heidegger will not make sense because Heidegger is very much a Nietzschean, and he knows this. And he is trying to be a Nietzschean very much, but he is taking Nietzsche in a different direction, and so do French thinkers following Nietzsche and Heidegger. Now, if you pay attention to the Hegel talk, and if you've uh, learned some of the Hegel, you will know that if I can teach you anything about philosophy, I would teach you that some Hegel, some Kant, definitely, if you're going to do analytic philosophy, but some Hegel, uh, some Kant, some Kant, but Hegel, Nietzsche, and Heidegger are very much the thinkers that separate the continent off from the analytic school. So if you know, and that's why Heidegger is kind of our final German thinker. He isn't because we're going to do a bunch of Wittgenstein and other stuff, and he's kind of Germanic plenty, but let's not get into that right now. We're going to cover Wittgenstein, and I will cover a little Marcuse here and there for, other, for this and other classes probably, if I have some time, because he is really cool, and with Hegel and modern Hegel and stuff like Zizek. But if you are going to know any German thought... You should probably know the basic ideas of Kant for everything in philosophy, but for the forking paths of the analytics and then the continent, the Germans and French, and then the Anglophiles, Anglophonics, whether or not they like it. The Germans and the, then the French are very into the Germans after Kant, which is the watershed. Kant parts ways. He is both. But then you have Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger in that order a Lutheran, an anti-everything guy, and a, and a Nazi, 
Heidegger it was a card-carrying Nazi, and in fact his black notebooks have been discovered in the last couple of years, which means he wasn't just a dude of his times. Lewis Carroll says a lot of things about Jewish and black people as a guy who doesn't know people, but none of them are really mean as much as just being like, oh, isn't that interesting? Such interesting, weird people are all God's children. Heidegger actually was very much an anti-Semite, whereas Lewis Carroll probably didn't know any Jewish people, says weird things about Jews, and then also says, oh, but the Israelites are children of, that, that will come to Jesus eventually. As I, Heidegger does not said some things, in spite of the fact that he did apparently carry on a affair with Hannah Arendt, a uh, possibly the most famous uh, female Jewish philosopher, uh, a good philosopher in her own right, independently, and a favorite of mine for the banality of evil at the Eichmann trial. Um, Heidegger probably carried on an affair and had ver uh, with a Jewish student while married, and also then had several prominent Jewish uh, students who were very big fans of him and carried on his work in many ways. And he was a raging anti-Semite, turns out, and was just keeping that somewhat under wraps, but was a card-carrying Nazi, exploited that. And so Heidegger is a very controversial thinker. But the reason I cover Heidegger is not only because I got good Heidegger in this town with Dreyfus, Hartman, and other folks, but at the same time, I really would not teach. There is a very big divide after the Black Notebook discoveries as to whether or not to teach or understand or like Heidegger at all. And Derrida is a big fan of just learn the guy. Who cares? It has nothing to do with his philosophy at all. What strikes people as irresponsible. But Derrida is also an advanced Frenchman. And he understands he's pissing people off by saying that. So keep that in mind when he's like, his, it has nothing to do with Nazism. He's being very French and being like, not at all. But he does know there's complexities. Keep that in mind. As you hear Derrida say, I don't care. I'm going to use ideas of Heidegger. I'm not even going to care that he's a Nazi in the slightest. Other people, I have read in print since the Black Notebooks came out, these are people who stake their careers and their tenure on Heidegger dissertations, etc. And much love to all those people out there and putting in the hard work and whether or not they can see a career at the end of the tunnel. And those people, and doing were a German philosophy in America, of course, is, is a hard job, but is a job. And, uh, and a good job, I think, is, is worth doing. I try to be the generalist in a lot of different stuff um, and show people the connections between many different cultures, but those who are specializing in German thought have it hard even if the Anglophonics rely on the German th thinkers and the French thinkers for so much and are so ignorant of how much we rely on these people. Heidegger is, uh, being a Nazi, made many people just say, I'm never going to do this again. So I am going to teach you the basic concepts of Heidegger. I don't think that any of these things, like te teaching people about love and hate, would not itself, and that's not Heidegger basic, but would not itself encourage you or discourage you from being a Nazi. Yes, if I teach you behaviorism, that wouldn't necessarily make you a Nazi or not, would it? No. So in the same token, I am not going to tell you to study Heidegger or Sartre or not because you do or don't like fascism or communism. Sartre is going to come along. We're going to do Bataille first because he actually is a hipper, interesting... I like Bataille more than Sartre, honestly, which is weird uh, because Bataille is weird. But Sartre is a card-carrying communist. He believes in being a Nietzschean and a Heideggerian French guy, and he calls it, with a label from Hegel, dun dun dun, -dun existentialism. So you cannot understand existentialism and French thought and French film where you chain smoke cigarettes in the in in the in the trench coat. What is this, a trench coat convention? In the rain, you know, like, life, she is cruel. And then you have to have postmodern times, which are more 80s uh, cyberpunk. Hey, we embrace the crazy and the lasers and the neon because existentialism is kind of still here, but it's kind of over and through it. You need to understand Heidegger in order to understand Sartre and existentialism in order to understand the sad, pessimistic state of a lot of art and Lars von Trier movies, for, which you should not watch. And then you need that in order to understand postmodernism and the hipness of it. And you only need to understand literally basic aspects of some of the basic concepts boiled into simple language in order to be quite informed about all of this, I have to say. It is stuff that takes years, and I love taking years to study through it, but the basics of Heidegger are actually important whether or not the guy is a Nazi. That is my spiel about why to study Heidegger, whether or not dude was a Nazi, and he straight up was. Um, whether or not he has uh, an affair with a uh, Jewish student and or Jew students of, uh, you know, yeah, um, and Jewish students who admired him and who clearly benefited from his work. And Derrida is clearly not a fascist, and he just goes way off the deep end with Heidegger and thinks it's amazing. So if you want to know Derrida or postmodernism, you certainly need to know the Heidegger. 
the Heideggers, and all of that. So, with that, that is the beginning intro on how Heidegger should be studied, whether or not he's a Nazi, because he is a proto-existentialist. Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and then Heidegger are the proto-existentialists before Sartre puts it all together as existentialism. Honestly, I love an example or two of Sartre, and he's not my favorite thinker, but he does bring it together as existentialism, and I know what that is, because I love Nietzsche a lot. Out of the existentialists... Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Sartre, which are can be called existentialists, just like Taoists can be called Taoists, but we don't know what they are, whether or not we call them proto or existentialists or existentialists. My favorite is Nietzsche, the first and foremost. He's the, a blatant anti-racist, so is Bataille, which is why I like him. He is very interesting in his thought, and he says, let's blow the doors open on all of this plenty. Uh, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre all have very serious hang-ups in my book, compared to Nietzsche, but Nietzsche was an imperfect person and he wore that on his sleeve and his mustache, you know, righteously. So that is why Nietzsche is my favorite. I am not the biggest Kierkegaard, Heidegger, nor Sartre guy, but I am an lecture on all of this and I do believe in knowing enough about it to lecture on all of it, of course. While Nietzsche is my favorite and I will over the years return much more to Nietzsche and doing detailed Nietzsche movies um, and <laughs> videos and things because, and then do a lot more on surreal art I do find Nietzsche to be really the early inspiration that's so amazing. Kierkegaard is amazing. He's also very hung up, again, much love on Christianity. Heidegger's hung up on politics and the social and the rebirth of the German. And Sartre is hung up very much on French communism and on, uh, well, international communism. Um, and being very hardlining and weirdly Cartesian. Sartre is weirdly Cartesian and Kierkegaardian, very much, strongly so with Descartes and the French. Um, remember, Descartes is the French guy we had. We haven't seen a lot of French folks yet. We will. In fact, we're going to be having nothing but some French folks for a while. I've got to do many thinkers here, um, still for the class, and for the class is. And we're going to get into some French folks after this German here, Heidegger. So that is the intro on all of that. Again, as already mentioned a few minutes ago. And that's why you need to know, in order to understand existentialism, you should also know some Dostoevsky and some Kafka. I will eventually make some videos, but I will only justifiably make those after I am done with Heidegger and Sartre and the French people, because and Poe, because then I will be ready to do a bit of Dostoevsky and Kafka and other stuff like that, which I only know the basics of, but the basics of in light of what I do know are quite powerful and good they are philosophy examples in literature, of course, very much throughout the works. So, with all of that, those are all pretty much existentialism, as it's called loosely, even though a lot of these folks, including Dostoevsky and Kafka, would not have called themselves existentialists. So that's why you teach Heidegger whether or not he was a freaking Nazi. And existentialism is allied very much with the left, more so surreal art, the left, and a lot of times left, uh, well, Sartre is the guy who coins the term, and he's a communist, and remains so when Camus was like, I'm an absurdist, uh, a little more anarchistic, and I'm out. And then didn't accept the Nobel Prize for just that reason, because he thought that that's why he was getting the award, because he broke from communism, so he didn't accept it. It would be a very justifiable interpretation of his actions. So just as, let's get into the material here, just as Nietzsche had studied to be a Lutheran minister before turning to philosophy, Martin Heidegger originally studied to be a Catholic theologian. But after it is usually Fr uh, the French and the Anglophonics, they try science or law, and then they turn to philosophy, sometimes in frustration or fascination. The Germans, it's usually religion. They're getting into being religious. This is also that they didn't have the, the German Revolution. They're still very much a religious and uh, revolting and having Lutheranism. Very much a solidly very religious people. But actually, Heidegger is the outlier line Catholic, oddly enough. He studied medieval European Neoplatonism, which I know a little bit about, and Hegel's take up of that. If Heidegger was as into, I'm sure he was way more into Hegel and Hegel's interest in Neoplatonism than I am, then he could have gotten a lot of his thought that ways, and he isn't being very open about that, but I know that. And then he also, like myself, I am not the Nazi, I would have been fascinated like Heidegger with the connections between European medieval mysticism and Neoplatonism and Taoism, Buddhism, as the Nazis are adopting the Indian and pan-human swastika um, a bit, you know, as their runic symbol. Um, Heidegger definitely was trying to find Taoism and Upanishadic stuff that shows the Ur thinking, which may or may not be in the hands of the Nazis, of course, along with the Ark, etc. So, 
he wrote his thesis, Heidegger did, on the Neoplatonist Duns Scotus. I wrote my master's thesis on Eriugena and Hegel, and so I know a little bit about why Heidegger would write his thesis on Duns Scotus. Not as much as somebody who's an expert on Heidegger and or Duns Scotus. I'm sure there's uh, plenty, you know, at least a dozen folks who are experts on at least one, if not both of those. I mean, I'm sure there's much more than a dozen on each, but uh, maybe there's a dozen people who are experts on exactly both. I don't know if that's set, you know, logically. But, fun fact, because Don Scotus argued that all things are alive, including rocks, he was labeled an idiot, which is where we apparently, although etymologies are uh, argued upon and over on the internet, this is supposedly where the term dunce comes from, which is oddly not in spell check, because perhaps we don't use it so much. So you make a kid who screws up sit in the corner like you have best and second best kid, and Kierkegaard doesn't get to be that as a kid according to his dad. See the Kierkegaard talk? Parenting, you know, is that you have dunce, uh, the term... Um, which is coming from Dun Scotus because he thinks rocks are alive. Again, other fun fact, Schopenhauer thinks crystals are halfway between rock and plant, and everything is much pantheistically alive, although he calls that atheism, because yes, Spinoza. So, Husserl, I do have, and I found, philosophy majors have great time in the morning to make uh, philosophy memes, as the teenagers call them, and exchange them on the iPhones. So, with the Das Ich phone and the German self, Husserl, who has one of the, uh, read some Hegel, um, and read plenty of else, and Heidegger, didn't read Heidegger, read Kant and Hegel, and try, and was a major phenomenologist, trying to show how intentionality and desire is, shapes our reality and our mental, physical world as we experience it, which is a very big dividing, dividing line between Kant and and Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger. Between the Anglophonic analytics who want static, logical, objective, rational, logical truth, that somewhat ma the best bet is mathematics, although still. And then you have desire is very structural to reality rather than math and reason after Kant with the more romantic Nietzsche and Heidegger. Hegel is not romantic. He's still trying to be rational, but and a rationalist and not a romantic, but he includes the motions of history. And after that in Darwin, Nietzsche and Heidegger take this far more Darwinian and psychological. The word psychology is now a thing. As Husserl is, as the Mimi goes, and I was working my way up to, there's a picture of him looking all stern and somebody thankfully in the high impact meme font says, every day I'm Husserlin. Yes. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, and you can do your Fortnite dances, and I shall not, nor dab will I. And just the fact I mention it means there is now an absence of such a thing in particular. It's Hegel, it's Hegelian, it's intentionality, you don't want me to do it, that now affects your universe. And your inner mental mind state. If there is even an inner mental man, man, where is that? Where's inside your mind? Am I out here? I don't know. So Husserl, the famed phenomenologist, he gets to be a phenomenologist after Hegel is one very much, took Heidegger under his wing as his star pupil at the University of Freiburg. And as Husserl's phenomenology rose to fame and gathered followers, Heidegger began to gather fame and followers of his own. Husserl wanted a science of the mind, a radical criticism of all philosophy and psychology up through Kant's metaphysics and Hegel's phenomenology. Husserl is famous for the idea of intentionality which is a very talked about concept. John Searle tried to spell that slightly differently and sort of intellectually patent it, and that I believe totally failed and should have. That consciousness is always directed towards something or away from something. That is a very major idea that I like. It is a dividing idea between, I saw somebody the other day actually mentioned I'm a continental realist, which means I know how Heidegger's a problem here. Let me just leave that there. Intentionality means our reality is structured emotionally or intentionally as far as what we want and what we don't want structures our reality. Think of Freud. Freud is going on at, uh, before and as and during this time, which is why when I say Heidegger was an influence on Freud, that may or may not be so true. But Nietzsche and Schopenhauer certainly were because it's hard not to be. But Heidegger is going on right at the same time, so it's easy for Freud to have missed it uh, decently, but not so much because Freud actually is through these years and all of that. But, again, it is far more arguable Freud was, I'm sure there's, it's again, I have some literature on this, I'm sure there's far more to read, about how Freud and his crew is, are far more Hegel and uh, Nietzsche. 
and Kant, like Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, but that would be the times. And Schopenhauer, I forgot him. Very much the German thinkers of the time are going off, so people are doing philo uh, psychology and philosophy in the vein of that, yes? So Husserl is trying to be a phenomenologist, psychologist, more grounded kind of sciencey guy. As he's doing that, he's doing psychology in the sense that reality is intentional, that is intentionality, which means anytime I'm dealing with an apple or a zebra or the Democratic Party, or uh, my job. I am dealing with something I like or don't like, and that is structural to my existence and consciousness, my reality. Whether or not that's true or not is actually still a very interesting issue, and I am of the opinion that Wittgenstein does provide, and was taught by people who teach, that uh, specifically Sluga, Stroud, and others, that Wittgenstein is the best way forward through this. And I have very specific thoughts on that. I will not tell you right now. But all of this stuff is very structural to Wittgenstein and then to later thought. Wittgenstein then is a massive influence in the analytic world, oddly enough, as a kind of a transplant. So, but this is very important for a lot of stuff. That whether or not our reality is structured uh, intentionally or not, and 2 plus 3 equals 5 is that way because we want it to be. Now think about that and how controversial that statement is and just let it float there controversially for you for a second and don't, because we all choose very much, and I know this because I pose these questions to people, let that kind of circle there for a second because why would you ever have math if you didn't need it? But at the same time, math doesn't seem to work. 2 plus 3 doesn't equal 5 when we want it to, but it almost seems like a bunch of hypocrites and, and jerks. <laughs> almost misspoke, in our lives, you know, almost want it to be six and then say it is, but at the same time, it's not that, but it is sort of math that would have to be a human wanted system, but why then is, is it exactly like it is in China or not? All of this stuff is actually psychology, of course, but also German philosophy, which is why it is so cool and hip for philosophy, German, uh, French thought, postmodernism, and, and uh, art. Our, our culture is very influenced by these ideas. Uh, to be a hip artist and to write interesting stuff, knowing something about these things and the twists and turns of it will help you. That is uh, Husserl. In fact, that is uh, Husserl studied the various and often subtle ways we are intentional in our world. Husserl kept writing and expanding his work, but rather than develop a new alphabet of thought as he originally intended, his work snowballed out of control and continued to amass until his death. Heidegger picked up Husserl's work, but merged it with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and took in it in what would later be recognized as an existential direction, because it isn't called that at the time. I think, I always say proto-existentialism. I am, through the course of this talk and also in talking over the years, I call it proto-existential existential because -existential I call them Taoist proto-Taoist for just the same reason. I'm trying to be accurate about who is called what, but at the same time, the names are retroactively applied anyway. Heidegger formed his own insights based on the work of Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Husserl. Insights which Heidegger himself thought were similar to ancient Chinese Taoism. He, Heidegger had Chinese and Japanese students in Germany, yeah, and uh, he did have them over occasionally for tea and talk about the Tao with more than one Chinese student and uh, talk about Zen um, and as such. There is recorded conversations of this that Heidegger was trying to figure out what of his philosophy and of Nietzsche was deeply in tune with Taoism and Buddhism, which is cool because actually, oddly, even though it is Nietzsche who is the more explicit anti-anti-Semite, and thus, although it is Bataille who says anti-racist, I believe, Bataille says never befriend a racist, that is pretty officially anti-racist. Nietzsche does not say uh, much about racism specifically, but is anti-nationalist and anti-Semite uh, anti in his own words. So that, again, um, somewhat like that. Then is misogynistic and not so much. Um, Heidegger is trying to oddly find similarities with Chinese and Indian thought. What's up, buddy? What's up? He's trying to find similarities with taming a tiger in Taoist thought and with Indian thought and with a tiger. He gets a kiss on the back. Body. All right. Well, thank you for that tiger break. The uh, It was appropriate, given the subject. So Heidegger first published his first and central work, Being and Time, Sein und Zeit. I am a bad Germanic person. I am an American. So I am, uh, as a white American, I'm a bad Germanic, pretty much. That's how that works. Cultural construction of identity, kids. 
And we had a tiger brake. And now we have the La Cucaracha truck brake. Yes. That actually does mean that the uh, construction noise is plenty will stop for a while, which is somewhat of the deal. And much love and happiness to all the peoples of the world, you know? I am trying to get into everything. So, unlike all of that, uh, unlike the work of Nietzsche, it was immediately uh, Sein und Zeit. Sein und Zeit. You'll notice, actually, a German person would notice how I just switched the S and the Z back the way English people... <laughs> Technically... S is pronounced as Z, and, and Z like S, I'm sure there's plenty of exceptions, and I'm a jerk. The uh, So it, it looks to the American like sign being unt, which is pronounced, it looks like und, but it's pronounced unt. I think there's different accents on that also in different parts of Germany. I am obviously a bad, again, Germanic white person. Um, time is, uh, is sight. It looks like Zeit. Notice the zeitgeist, the time ghost, um, the ghost of the time, the spirit of the times is the zeitgeist. You've heard the word zeitgeist? That's the, the ghost time, the time ghost. Uh, it's literally time ghost, um, which would mean the spirit of the times in German. But that would be, in, in English, you would say zeitgeist. In, uh, it would be zeitgeist, I believe, in, uh, is a bad pronunciation still, of German, because S and Z are switched in German. And again, this is all the Anglophone, you know, this is all the Indo-European stuff, uh, the Anglophonics and all of us get from the Germans, the Germanic people, you know, and the Romance languages and all that passing through that area of Europe, you know, if you speak English at all, right? And then we switch the S and the Z sounds. So actually, instead of Sein und Zeit, which I actually did say, it's Sein und Zeit, I believe, and I am just terrible, you know, at languages. I, again, I think I need immersion and I want to stay here. So... Yes, I got to go out and hang out at the truck. Unlike the work of Nietzsche, it was uh, Heidegger's work. His early work was immediately popular. Nietzsche, unfortunately, got, if you remember the Nietzsche, Nietzsche got popular as he was starting to go nuts, unfortunately, which is sad. Like his father, genetically, um, probably disposed to that um, with all nature, nurture, and all of that. And unfortunately, of course, Nietzsche's opponents do constantly say he went nuts because he was terrible. Heidegger, and, for, and then Heidegger goes on, Nietzsche is the anti-racist. Heidegger was a Nazi, so I suppose that's good for your health. The nature hikes with blonde children. Unlike the work of Nietzsche, uh, Heidegger's work was immediately popular. When Heidegger was a young prodigy, kind of young grad student air, uh, age. And it sparked intense conversations and debates in the academic community of the time. Because a lot of people realized, recognized Heidegger's soaking up of, he soaks up a lot of Kant, he soaks up a lot of Hegel, he's obviously doing a lot of Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche, but he also knows his Christian mysticism. Now, that all of that, and then he's branching out from there into philosophy of the world. All of that is German philosophy ground Grundwerk. I don't freaking know, man. The I'm Californian out here. So yes, to this day, many consider Heidegger to be one of the most profound of philosophical geniuses. Others consider him actually to be a fool and a charlatan, read the first couple of pages and say, this isn't telling me anything. Now, part of that is actually American philosophy is common language movement, but it's still hard to read. German and, Fre German and French thinkers do not try to slow down and make sense. They very much treat philosophy, and this is not the world, this is not Greek and not Chinese philosophy. It is a bit Indian philosophy. Indians and Germans like making long words by smashing smaller words together a lot. And in philosophy, they like going on and on and on. The long discourses of the Buddha. The Buddha meditated, and he also didn't shut up much other than in meditating, because he apparently has long and long, you know, huge discourses. I have videos on all of that. He goes back and forth and talks to all kinds of people. So Heidegger and French thinkers, and they like, Heidegger is very much imitating Kant and Hegel. He thinks in order to be a great philosopher, you have to write like Kant and Hegel. And in order to do that, you have to write long books in German that are very hard to read. A lot of French thinkers do that as well. Bataille, not so much, but he is sort of an outlying guy writing journal articles and very weird stories, some of the worst and crazy, that he is then doing a lot of more pop work. I see him more as kind of a Poe-like figure where he's not a guy writing long books of philosophy. He's different from all that, though, entirely, somewhat, a bit. But Heidegger here is writing long books of philosophy. He thinks they have to be very difficult to understand. I think it can equally be said. It is my judgment that, honestly, there's plenty of truth to both of these sides. On the one hand, there are very good concepts in the work of Heidegger that are worth your understanding. 
There are. They tell you about how your world is emotional, how people behave, even if you want to be purely psychological. I like saying I have a psychological view of the world. So if you want to have a psychological view of the world and you understand what that sort of vaguely means, kind of what the heck wasn't. A Hawaiian view wasn't a psychological view? I don't know. Are Hawaiian myths psychological views? I think sort of, so what is that? But when I say and point hold and place hold and point at a psychological view and do the can can dancey fingers, scare quotes as they're called, like a scarecrow. There's to scare you into knowing that this is something I heard warning you with the dancey legs. Which are gender neutral, you do not know. And naked. So, many consider Heidegger to be a genius, others consider him to be writing long books trying to trick people. To be honest, if I, because I know Heraclitus, and because I know Nietzsche, and because I like Heraclitus and I like Nietzsche, and because I later like Derrida, Derrida understands, Derrida gets from a philosopher's continental point of view why Derrida is screwing with people. Derrida is accused of the same kind of charlatan nonsense. I do and don't think that's true. And the reason is because I get academic skepticism and philosophical skepticism. And these guys are all Heraclitus, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida. And I'm going to get to Derrida and do some of his stuff, especially Derrida versus Searle, which is funny and amazing. All these guys know that reality is subjective, right? Psychological, right? So their work is trying to throw you. It's very much like Zen, except it's a long, long books with a lot of words, which isn't very Zen. They like to slap you in the face or show you a finger or, you know, all kinds of things. But like Taoists, Heidegger was interested in Taoism. But Heidegger also does not write short Taoist passages, although he clearly loved them translated in the German. And there were Germans into the Tao and other things and Indian thought at this time. A little too much of Indian culture, you know, and other stuff. So again, I have the image, the Nazis fighting Gan giant Godzilla-like Ganesh, and it's like, the Nazis stole the swastika, the swastika, Ganesh wants it back. And he's like, Arr! and you can look that up. I love that image. I don't know who put that together. It's, or I think it's a propaganda poster of, like, India fighting the Nazis, and somebody reappropriated it. Could easily be, I'm realizing for the first time, it could easily not be a modern image, but a image of, like, India and Ganesh fighting Nazis, and somebody just put... You know, meme, again, high impact font over it, Ganesh wants it back, you know, and it's like, that's awesome. But yes, again, because can universally beat up effectively on the Nazis, you know what I mean? So yeah, and Heidegger, it's time for, and the being and the time and the sein und Zeit and whether or not I get that at all right. In 1927, Freud is doing his, that's right around the time when Freud, Heidegger's into Hegel, Fichte, that's right around the time... Uh, ego, id, and superego were coming into Freud's thinking in the 1910s and 20s is when Freud was coming up with his later thinking and the ego and the superego, the id and the superego negotiating with the ego, etc. and all of that. I'll leave that to the psychoanalysts. I will cover a bit of Lacan because of this. So basically all of that means there that... Heidegger is a genius. He is somebody you should study, or at least you should get the basic concepts from this and then completely ignore the rest of it, you know, uh, forever. But whether or not you want to return to Heidegger's ideas again and again or not at all, he is a very influential thinker. He is very influential for a lot of hip thinkers who are French and who are all over the world now who have been influenced by French surrealism and French art and, and humor and modern American humor. We have a very surreal, existential, postmodern view of the world now, culturally. Heidegger is a very big influence on that and influential on folks. If you want to know your history, you have to know your Heidegger. You want to know your history of uh, philosophy and history of art, thought, uh, thought in art and philosophy, you need to know your Heidegger. A little bit. Some basic concepts. And even then, people will constantly disagree with you because this is designed to subvert your expectations and get all around. People will very much tell you you're always getting it wrong. That's another thing that's annoying about Heidegger is people will always tell you because these concepts, like with some of Freud, are designed to be, Lacan has a very Heideggerian Freudian concept called Le Petit Algea, which is very much kind of the mulligan, kind of uh, the MacGuffin, not a mulligan, MacGuffin, the object that you cannot possess. So anytime you try to describe what it is structurally, people can always tell you you're an idiot because of course, in a certain sense, an unpossessable object has no structure, it is there. But as soon as you try to describe what that sort of is in a, in a situation, anybody can come up to you and say, no, you're missing it. Because in a certain sense, we're talking about no types of non-being. Now, I like that stuff and it is worth talking about. It isn't just meow, 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 nonsense, meow, 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 federal task force, meow. But you know what I mean. 
that in 2000, uh, f that with all of this stuff, Heidegger is important, but in 2014, as mentioned, the controversy was rekindled by the publication of his notoriously anti-Semitic black notebooks. They were actually like the blue and brown notebooks of Wittgenstein. I think that they're black notebooks because they're actually bound in black, which is why they're called that, I believe. Not that they're so awful. Um, or something like that, like black is in dark is in bad. You know what I mean? Not bad meaning bad, but bad. Not here meaning run DMC. So we will consider all of this in light of uh, the political involvement with the Nazis for a second or two after we talk about the major ideas. And again, Derrida is a big fan of saying it's totally independent and his ideas from his politics. Others, his politics are a result of his ideas. We can't allow this. I am somebody who constantly teaches people the back and forth between objectivity and subjectivity, between dogmatism and skepticism. Those are major things in human thought. That's what Hegel teaches, and I like that idea of Hegel very much. Objectivity and subjectivity are constantly cooperating and fighting throughout human history of thought. Anybody who does tell you that uh, believing in objectivity or subjectivity itself philosophically will result in the evil side Usually I am skeptical of those claims. It is totally true that dogmatism or skepticism can support all the awful things. That definitely happens. Is it the case, though, that believing in dogmatism or believing in skepticism and Heidegger will result in being a Nazi or a communist? No. Or, uh, or a hippie and uh, tuning in and dropping out? No. No, I don't think so, because honestly, these things hook up all over the place, and it takes all kinds, you understand what I mean? The Nazis were themselves all kinds of people. I, uh, I have a, there's a great documentary I highly recommend called Architecture of Doom, which was recommended, I, for, I forget by whom, it's, I be, it's a European documentary, I am going to forget the uh, Scandinavian country from which it is, uh, from, uh, that it's from. But it basically says the Nazis were doctors, they were gardeners, they were this, they were that, they were school teachers, they were barbers, they were, you know, they were philosophers. And in philosophy, as philosophers have mentioned, and I think Kaufman goes off on this when Nietzsche is called a Nazi in the beginning of his book Nietzsche, which is a major foundational work on Nietzsche, that he says, you know, all kinds of people have used Nietzsche for all kinds of things. Here's a bunch of that. Please don't think Nietzsche is a Nazi. Heidegger was, of course, a Nazi. But I would never tell you believe in objective truth or don't believe in objective truth. All of that is just going to result in X. No, what I am constantly trying to show people, you can expect people to believe in objectivity and subjectivity and take those defensive attack positions, belief and doubt. You can expect people to believe in doubt and everything and go all over the place. That's very Nietzsche, which is totally appropriate to bring up as Heidegger because Heidegger thinks he is doing Nietzsche as psychology, effectively. He is trying to do a more phenomenological, psychological, every damn Husserl, Husserlin. He is trying to do a Husserl psychology of Nietzsche, is what Heidegger is trying to do. And in set there, he comes up with several important key concepts. Amongst those concepts, specifically, the idea of the self as a not specifically self or closed, but an open self and a their being, which is called their being, Dasein, um, which we will talk about, but this is another thing, like Le Petit Orgea, Dasein is a concept which is not really a fully closed concept such that anybody who says anything about Dasein usually is missing it somehow. It's not inside, it's not outside. It's your whole being reality, selfness in your reality, as your reality. So saying it that, that way, and again, even here the language will not work, of course, and people say, no, your being is a their being, which is thrown into the world, which you do not choose, but which is just suddenly there in the world with a bunch of stuff going on. You're thrown into a Nietzschean jungle, which is Heidegger's concept of thrownness. And we are thrown into a world as a being there. There is a famous movie with Peter Sellers. It's a very existential film, very nihilistically kind of a... By nihilistic, I mean pessimistic, I should more properly say. Existential film rather than... I would say so postmodern that it is uh, about a man who is mentally uh, handicapped and he is a gardener. His boss dies. 
he then wanders around in the world and people keep thinking he is somebody that he isn't and he just pl pleasantly is like yes sure and he gets remarkably ahead in life by being like yes sure and just making pleasant metaphors about gardening and people think he is effectively some kind of genius and he is then brutally identified with jesus several times in the film as a mentally uh somewhat in uh, you know um well yes a mentally simple man let us call it that pleasantly and i am trying not to be Horrible and offensive. So, with all of that, there's being there. That is a, whole, a hopeless reference to there being Dasein um, of Heidegger, or if it isn't, that really should have been. Uh, what are you doing? We are a being there. We are a here being, a there being, and we are thrown into it, and that we are always looking over the horizon. That is basically also with time, and the ways that Heidegger talks about time being involved with our purposes in life is very brilliant in several ways. But the basic understandings and concepts of Heidegger, which I'm going to do, as I thought, another video, trying to make these shorter, more condensed, but also chunk them appropriately. I am going to do another video on Heidegger, and we will walk this out for another couple of minutes here. But Heidegger's essential thinking is we are thrown into the, be into the world such that we are being in the world as an open-ended being here and all and inside, outside, very Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein lines up with this stuff a lot, but he says it in much clearer ways and leaves a lot unsaid also. Heidegger tries to say it all. Wittgenstein leaves a lot unsaid here and just doesn't say words, but... Wittgenstein has a very similar conception of the self. We are and are not. We're open and closed. We are inside and outside ourselves. That is our reality. That's something like what Heidegger is describing as Dasein, their being, being there, uh, your here-ness, your there-ness, your where you are-ness as your inner outer reality selfness, your individual reality, which is calling attention to certain things for you. Heidegger talks about the world as if it's interacting with you, as if it is intentional. So the world calls to you, he says in his later thought, you are responding to it as if you are in and out and thing. This is very theological sounding uh, language. Heidegger, unlike Kierkegaard, does not talk about God and Christ a ton, I think, I'm pretty sure. I think he does talk about that quite openly in certain ways, not as a practicing religious person, because he really isn't. I think that he, I think he remained going to services, but he isn't being theological so much. It is, in a certain sense, as if we are, as something jumps out at you, as if you're interested in it, as if you have a relationship with the world, as if you're not just all in your head. That's what Heidegger is trying to get to, where our emotionality and our intentionality is inside and outside of us as our reality. Now, that's very wise to point out, and there's a lot of Taoism and Zen I like, which is why Heidegger's get, getting into that, that point out how we're inside and outside our heads emotionally, intentionally. That is very much what Heidegger's into. That we are then also looking over the horizon. The idea of the horizon, which is not only notice that you yourself are open and closed as Dasein, but the world as having a here-ness, but then over the horizon of time, and what's uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And what's coming, we don't know, it's all open and scary. That this is formative for your being and reality, that reality is open-ended and therefore formatively scary and intentional and loving and intentional in these ways, in the openness of it. Heidegger is making being very emotional, moody, intentional, and that this is structural to inner and outer reality. That is what is going on in the plainest of speak. And here again, always Heideggerians could have words with other Heideggerians, and certainly with me, and I would ignore Almost all of them. Not because they're Heideggerians, because that's what I do with people. But you understand. I'm paying attention to your words right now. Now I'm not. So, for Heidegger, the goal, and this is very Nietzsche, after Kant and Hegel, the goal is not, and it, Schopenhauer is not so system building, but he tries to be. The goal is not the system of absolute knowledge and the system or the system of perspectives. It's, it's an absolutes for Kant. It's perspectives and a system of perspectives for Hegel. I usually like to say Nietzsche says it's an open-ended jungle with Darwin. Heidegger's trying to describe what psychology is like in the open-ended jungle, so he's not trying to build a system like Kant or Hegel. But he is trying to describe what fundamental psychology is, to explain it to the average person. A Heideggerian, again, I have ticked off specifically Forrest Hartman and much love to that dude because he is an institution in Iraq. I, and I am, I saw him years ago, uh, randomly in a movie theater. The, uh, that's, 
the that man was a Heideggerian machine gun. Again, I, I hope he is still around and, and kicking like heck, because I'm sure if he's still around, he is kicking like heck. But it is not, call it, I call it psychology. I once upset him greatly by calling Heidegger psychology. For me, everything is kind of psychology. And for the average person, this is psychology. For a Heideggerian, it's not psychology because that makes it sound like a positivistic science that wants facts. You see the problem here. Think about a more hippie therapist uh, psychologist and you understand. If you think about a hippie therapist psychologist talking to a more clinical psychologist who says it's absolute data and the therapist is like, yeah, um, Heidegger is more on the side of the abs of the hippier therapist, which is my area of the land and family and stuff. That's in my family. My family were th are German. They're thankfully not card-carrying Nazis, um, you know, nor were. And yeah, we're out here in the Americas before all that, and yeesh, so yes. But in the course of World War I and World War II, as I always like to mention, white people forgot they're German, and they think they're sort of British, but they're not sure. That's like most white people today, and so American white, you know? White, uh, again, as Homer's brother says in The Simpsons, when white met bread. So, much love and happiness, and I love myself and my family like heck, you know? So, hey. We, uh, I do love dissing, tearing everybody down, gotta do it, you know, punching up and around. So, with, uh, again, it's not a system, it is more the practice of psychology and ongoing stuff. That's why Heidegger writes long books, it is hard to nail them down. It is also, and I may as well stop the talk right here, because it's a perfect place to stop, and then we'll get into specifically what, how Heidegger thinks we structure the world. One of the things you can get into endless fights with Heideggerians is whether or not our minds are psychological, whether or not this is psychology and whether or not this is a, uh, you also, whether or not this is a system. Now, anybody trying to understand it, and I'm trying to explain it, so I have to boil it down for you, is going to read long-winded Heidegger and try to boil it down in their mind and senses. And I love saying boil it down with Wittgenstein. A lot of what we try to do to understand things is like trying to reduce it. You can also feel and, and hear and understand as a human being the instincts to not, to be claustrophobic, and I am very much this way, resist the instinct to close it down. So Heidegger is constantly trying to system build, but he is also taking it back constantly, which is what makes Heidegger accused of saying nothing, but also when he does pop off amazing concepts in doing these practices, actually makes him historically important. So he's writing long, confusing books that aren't easy to read. He is also trying to show how we have a common psychology in the jungle-ish, but he doesn't want to systematize it. That's why it's hard to read Heidegger. That's why it's hard to get Heidegger, for, in the simplest ways of saying that. There's endless complexity beyond that, of course, as the subject matter itself, which is going unmentioned almost as I say those words alone. But Heidegger does say how we're thrown into a jungle and a chaos and then over the horizon it's open and this fundamentally makes us close up or open up emotionally and that that is structural to our reality. Now that is a concept that would be interesting to anyone pretty much, you know? Because we're all psychological people even if you need to say that many words which is confusing already. So Heidegger is going to talk about how the world is closed and open in ways that are highly influential to French thought, and Heidegger is a bridge between the amazing thought of Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche, and uh, even Schopenhauer, although Heidegger, I think, shies away from Schopenhauer and isn't so Schopenhauerian, which is odd because he's very Kantian, which is odd for, and there's a lot of good work on how Kantian he is, which is not intuitive because he is pushing away from, and with Hegel, away from Hegel, post-Nietzsche. But he is actually very Kantian, very Hegelian, very Nietzschean, and he is a bridge that brings those ideas and his own into core French post-war thought. And who are the first? Well, Bataille, Sartre, and onward to the post -structuralist, structuralists, post-structuralists, and postmodernists. So that's going to take us, actually, and then I'm going to cover some Anglophonic stuff. I will cover some Anglophonic folks, analytics, and uh, pragmatists in particular. And a lot of people have compared Heidegger to pragmatism and to Wittgenstein. I like Heidegger thus plenty. I prefer my Wittgenstein. I actually do like speaking of anti-racism here or anti-cultural kind of supremacy, uh, etc. Wittgenstein apparently had a colleague who was Brit uh, in, uh, in Britain with him in England. And during World War II, he told Wittgenstein, the, the Brit, that he thought that the British would win World War II because they have a better character, cultural character, than the Germans. And Austrian Wittgenstein, who was struggling with how he was Jewish and Austrian his whole life and conflicted about that, said... I don't see how somebody so stupid could ever do philosophy. 
is that you think that Britain and British people in general have a better character than the Germans. He certainly doesn't believe that. But that some people's character over another people's character would be something like being or time itself, you know, being superior in that. He's like, I don't see how anybody's so foolish as you. Because, of course, he's thinking all grandly about what is universal for us all psychologically. And he has no time, you know, for this guy thinking the Brits have a better stiff upper lip and keeping calm and carrying on as a national character and a zeitgeist. Zeitgeist? Zeitgeist? Depends what your zeitgeist is. Yeah? So it's zeitgeist out here. Yeah? Take it back some. So with all of that, come and get it, you know? As I always say, should have bombed France and then Britain uh, during WW2. I never would have seen it coming, you know? Would have been consistency. So... Anyway, much love. I am not speaking homicidally, actually. I'm joking and being silly again and being all too American. With all of this and my ignorant pronunciations of German as a Germanic. White people. So, much love and happiness. I will cap this talk right now at here in the time and it's being will and appropriately. So... I will carry on here on how we approach each other and the world as an open and closed thing with Heidegger being open and closed about him and his politics next time here in another talk. So much love, much happiness, much being, much time, much life, and its forms, a la Wittgenstein. And I will see you if I do ever see you.